Hello, and welcome to this tutorial on the skills required to perform endoscopic retinal surgery. This is Martin Uram, and I will be guiding you through the techniques that are required for you to become a fantastic endoscopic retinal surgeon. So first, let's talk about the technology that is required to perform laser endoscopy. There are two sets of componentry involved here. The first are the laser endoscopes themselves. They subserve three functions, providing imaging, illumination, and laser delivery. These instruments are comprised of a central core of fiber optic imaging fiber, surrounded by a number of tiny light fibers and one embedded laser fiber. Depending upon the surgeon's requirements, they come in a variety of configurations, including straight or curved, 19 to 23 gauge, and various levels of resolution and field of view. Fiber optic image resolution is defined by the number of picture elements or pixels. Simplistically put, the higher the number, the better the resolution. Just know that there are other variables that determine the image quality besides this feature. The price for more pixels is a larger diameter of the image guide. In the world of microendoscopy, every 50 microns is significant, and so the surgeon must sometimes trade off better resolution for a smaller size. The first human endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, or ECP, was performed with a 3,000 pixel laser endoscope. As you can see from the original video, it achieved a certain level of resolution and at best, a limited field of view. Since that time, advances in technology have expanded the range of imaging fibers. From the other videos here, you can see improved resolution and field of view depending upon the ultimate outer diameter of the laser endoscope. The second set of the componentry is the laser endoscopy console that consists of an 810 nanometer diode laser, a bright xenon light source, a high resolution video camera, and a video monitor. Now let's consider some advantages associated with endoscopic retinal surgery. One might argue that the operating microscope view is all that is required for monitoring vitreoretinal surgery. However, the benefits of endoscopy are more apparent when anterior segment conditions do not permit a posterior view or when attempting to view anatomy that is difficult or impossible to see even under optimal conditions through the operating microscope. Specifically, I'm referring to the peripheral retina, pars plana, ciliary body, ciliary sulcus, and posterior iris regions. It is a common experience to have a deteriorating intraocular view during vitrectomy. A cloudy cornea, meiotic pupil, hyphema, cataract formation, condensation on the posterior capsule surface during air fluid exchange, and others are frequent impediments to proceeding with a clear intraocular view, especially in more prolonged cases. When inserting the endoscope through the pars plana, these clinical situations become irrelevant because the view is derived from the tip of the endoscope, which is within the eye and posterior to the difficulties that are occurring. These videos demonstrate that despite an opaque cornea or a meiotic pupil, surgery may proceed unabated. In these examples, the peripheral retina, pars plana, ciliary body, and posterior iris regions are easily imaged with good resolution and wide field of view. This is not possible through the operating microscope. Consider that the operating microscope provides a top-down, limited field of view. Endoscopy can create this top-down view as well as one that is oblique, coaxial, or from an inferior position anywhere within the ocular interior and always with a wide field of view. This ability can provide the surgeon with some unique views of the intraocular pathology and engendering novel treatments that are not possible by conventional or operating microscope imaging. Endoscopy by definition is two-dimensional, while operating microscope posterior viewing under ideal conditions can be stereoscopic. Peeling fine macular membranes under good conditions is simpler under the operating microscope. On the other hand, 
stereopsis diminishes markedly as one moves to the retinal periphery or when anterior segment conditions deteriorate. Under these circumstances, the panoramic view afforded by the endoscope becomes an excellent trade-off and a good alternative to stereoscopic viewing. For instance, grabbing the edge of a membrane with a forceps and pulling it from the retinal surface under wide field endoscopic guidance may permit the surgeon to see that vast sheets of gliotic tissue are being rapidly removed from the retina and so this dissection may continue. Or it may reveal the traction on one end of the membrane is producing a distant retinal break requiring cessation of the maneuver. This is not often possible under operating microscope guidance. Some endoscopic maneuvers are simpler and more rapidly performed even when they may be executed under operating microscope guidance. These will be discussed shortly. Teaching is a great benefit of endoscopy. Observers in the operating room can clearly see what the surgeon sees and can be invaluable in the training of others. Surgical assistants can learn to be more helpful by observing the progress of the case, understanding the difficulties that may arise, and knowing best how to assist the surgeon in dealing with them. Teaching oneself can be a tremendous asset of endoscopy. Recording your cases and reviewing them later will reveal not just how fabulous you really are, but also where you could improve a skill or eliminate some maneuvers that have proven to be unsuccessful.